thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thank you, John, and thanks to Loyola for having me back. I was here a couple of years ago and uh, had a nice time talking with everybody who came to the show. Um, I'm using the mic for two reasons. One is, I guess, they're recording it, and they're going to stream it or whatever they're going to do. The other is that I'm actually hoarse, which is unusual for me, but so you're going to be spared any serious harangues, probably. Unless you really get me angry, and I'll just be screaming. But, um, but here's the deal. Um, over the years, <coughs> I've done probably thousands of interviews. And most interviews I've done are with, obviously, journalists or radio stations. Um, and the questions they ask, they're really kind of skewed to that particular perspective. They kind of represent the people who are reading uh, the magazines or listening to the radio station but they're actually not the questions that people might ask themselves because they're in the, the business themselves, they're in the industry, so they have a certain kind of predictable uh, meter, these, these uh, interviews. And at some point, I got to thinking about the idea of somebody invited me to come speak somewhere, and I said, well, I don't really have prepared more remarks, I don't have any kind of speech to give, um, but if people are curious and want to ask me questions, I'd be happy to do one giant interview with everybody who comes. So this is essentially a giant interview. For those of you who know nothing about what I do, then you can ask me what I do. And for those of you who know something about it, you can ask me some specifics if you want. We can talk about anything or nothing at all. We can stand here and just stare at each other for an hour. Um, <laughs> and we can try that. It'll be boring on the internet. But uh, So the, somebody asked me questions. These are the mics, I guess. And don't be shy, because every moment being shy will be lost in terms of opportunity to talk. I don't know how long we're going to go, for an hour-ish? OK. So jump into it. Let's do it. You get a no. <laughs> <laughs> you coming? OK. Oh. <laughs> um, Straight edge. <laughs> Can you be a little more specific about that? <laughs> okay, so um, like on the whole not drinking, not smoking, all that. Well, why do you, why did you decide to start doing that? All right, let me. Okay, for those of you who don't know, and I'm not going to be presumptuous and think that everybody here knows exactly what he's talking about. And for those of you who do know, that you'll have to sit through this a little bit. In 1980, I was in a band called Minor Threat, and I wrote a song called Straight Edge. Now this was a song that was about my decision in my life to not get high, to not drink, to not just sort of engage in really sort of conquest-oriented like sort of sex stuff, like just trying to get laid. And like I felt really removed from my community, like my community of high school kids, because I was in high school at that time. And growing up in high school, everybody got high. Everybody just partied. In fact, rebellion, if, there, if such a thing existed in high school, seemed to only exist, like that was the criteria of rebellion. That's the way you rebelled against society, was to essentially self-destruct to some degree. And there was just something in my life that I was not interested in. When I first got into punk rock, which would have been early 1979, um, I felt like a true deviant because I did not get high. And the first punk show that I went to, I realized, well, these people are all deviants. They're all deviating from society to some degree. They're challenging all these conventional thinking, these ideas about music and uh, fashion, obviously, and politics and sexuality. And I, felt, I felt really quite at home with these people because I felt like I was an alien in the larger society. Um, I think punk rock, for me, was always a question of marginalized people, people who were trying to figure out, like, well, who am I? And then finally, well, here's some people who also don't know who they are, so let's be us. That'll be the us now. Um, what was interesting about being a kid who was not getting high, not sort of self-destructing and getting involved with punk rock was that the punk rockers really were like, they were like, they protected that. They were like, you're freaks, which was kind of cool. You actually, like, for a guy who's like, a complete junkie, like who's like, you know, drinking 
vodka out of a mayonnaise jar. For him to call me a freak, I felt good. You know, I thought I, I was getting <laughs> But it wasn't like, uh, I have to say that it was never a, uh, it wasn't calculated. It wasn't, there was no precursor. I didn't know, I didn't, it, was, it was just like, that's just who I was. And that's who, like, our friends, like, my friends, we just didn't party. We just wanted to go skateboarding or go see a movie or take a long walk. We just did stuff like that. So when we got involved with punk rock, we're like, well, we just don't want to do that. We just want to play music. That's all we wanted to do was play music. And we wanted to go see our friends' bands play. Um, to the very beginning, the first song I wrote that kind of alluded to the, what became like this, this straight-edge song uh, was a song called uh, I Drink Milk. And it's a, kind of, it's a silly song. It was just, you know, I drink milk, I drink milk, I drink milk, I drink milk. I don't care what people say. I drink milk with a vitamin A. I drink milk, I drink coke, I drink coke, I drink coke. I don't care what people say. I drink coke with a tooth decay. That was like, that's basically the song. But it was kind of like, that was, punk rock was goofy. And we were just like laughing. And what was incredible about this was that this goofiness, think about how silly those lyrics are, but it was met with such anger. Like it was incredible that people like would just were like, you wouldn't even fascist, you know, like, what are you we're just kids, you know, we're just kids. And, and the, the conversation that got started by the fact that we did not participate in this sort of group nihilism thing. Um, I never felt like we didn't go after them. We weren't like pointing people out going like you're you know you're a drug addict, and you're a drinker, and all this stuff. That, we were just ourselves, but they were more than happy to call us like Mormons or Korean freaks or, you know, or, or pure-minded, insane people. Or, and what? Um, <laughs> but what, what happened was that this conversation started to roll, and it started to get more heated. When I was in Minor Threat, I decided to write a song called The Straight Edge. Now, part of the reason that this title came up was it was actually, there was a candidate for the name of the band. It was a new band. I had been playing bass in the band of Teen Idols, I-D-L-E-S, Idols. And at that, the point that band broke up, I wanted to sing. I had written most of the lyrics for the band, and I wanted to sing. So Minor Threat, that next band was forming, and the drummer Jeff and I were talking about band names, and I said, about straight edge, because I love the idea of like, you know, straight edge ruler, straight edge razor, and then this idea that we're straight, and it was like this kind of concept. I wrote, and then we decided not to go to straight edge. And here's a, a tip for those of you who are looking for band names. Don't pick a band name that starts with the letter S. Because if you ever work in a record store, and you have to look at the S assorted section, you're not happy, because there's a million bands that start with the letter S. So avoid it. That's my first useful tip. That's my maybe the only useful tip I'll have all night. But so we decided not to go with that. So instead we chose minor threat. But if you think about it, the name minor threat, again, we were playing with this whole celebration of being kids, teenagers, teen idols, minor threat. Um, and the song, I decided to use the name Straight Edge for a song. And I wrote those lyrics. Now this was a song about my life. It was about the way I look at things and my decisions. And it was essentially inspired by a song by Jimi Hendrix, of all people, a song called If Six Were Nine. And in that song, he's singing about being a freak. And he says, I'm the one who has to die when it's time for me to die. So let me live my life the way I want to. And those words, when I was a kid, hearing those words, it just blew my mind. So essentially, Straight Edge was the same <laughs> message. It's my life. So don't give me a hard time for my decisions to not engage in like what everybody seems to do all the time. Now what developed out of that was a lot of confusion because we were these kids and we freaked people out everywhere because we just would go to shows. We weren't, like we were trying to get into these, trying to make all shows all ages. So we put the X's on our hands to say, look, if we're drinking and you see an X on our hand, 86 is forever. But it was not like some fashion statement. It was actually like a pragmatic decision. We were trying to force the clubs to let kids in the shows. It's a political thing when you think about this. Because the fact that music is not open to all people is nuts. I mean, how many people here start listening to music when they're 15 years old? Anybody? <laughs> Did anybody listen to music when they were 15 or 16, 17? Did music mean anything to you in those ages? Did you give a about it? Did you care about it at all? 
the fact that you can't see a bloody band that makes this music, that plays this music, you can't see them until you're 21, that's insane. That's completely insane. Who's called the shots on that? So we were really like <coughs> interested in forcing clubs to let us into the venues. Now it so happens that in Washington DC at that time, the drinking age is 1980, the drinking age was 18. And it just so happened that there were some laws on the book that said that any establishment that serves alcohol <coughs> in Washington DC must also serve food. So essentially, there was no such thing as a bar. There were only restaurants. And there's actually nothing on the book saying that a restaurant is like kids can't go to restaurants. So we came across this, this <coughs> law, and we went to the club and said, look, we guarantee we won't drink. We want to see the bands. And the first club was 930 Club, um, and they and then DC Space. They essentially they went along with it. And we said, look, we'll put the X's on our hands ourselves. Then you know. And that's where that came from. But we started the straight edge. Like song, we didn't call ourselves Straight Edge. We said we were like we're straight. Straight Edge was the name of the song. But what happened with Minor Threat Tour is that we started running into these sort of counter groups. Um, this is like 1981, 82, 83. We get to like a town like Kansas or something, and there'll be a guy come up and say, "We're the Vintage Movement, or we're the Round Edge Movement, or the..." Whatever. And you're like, "What?" Like we didn't have those those things. That, in my mind, there was no Straight Edge Movement. So I didn't understand why there had to be like an opposition. But sometimes opposition is what creates things. And that opposition was really, it was the first movement I ever encountered with the opposition. And somewhere in there, this idea, it really seemed to resonate with kids around the country and then people who started taking more militant, made more of a militant statement about drinking <coughs> or about being straight. And at that point, I was really like, wow, this is not the idea I ever had. I certainly never intended to be a movement. I wasn't interested in people uh, using like, a song like Straight Edge or this idea as any kind of basis for uh, sort of aggressive action or disciplining or whatever. This is nuts. And it kind of just went away from me. But that's that's life. That's like, that's like It's incredible. It's, almost, it's like a surreal thing that things can just it's like a phenomenon. It just went off on its own. And to this day, the fact that the first question just says, why straight edge? And think about it, I'm 44, you know? I, this is a song I wrote 26 years ago. And that, to me, is a phenomenon. It's not like I'm going around every day going like, you know, like, I don't beat, like, I don't like ban the straight edge flames or, you know, I don't do that. I'm not a part of any kind of movement. I don't have a top to write on the name. I don't get a nickel every time I use it. I don't make shirts. I don't, I'm not involved with any of that. And yet, that shows you the power of music, that you can infuse music, which is such a sacred, tribal thing, ultimately. And you put in words that you mean, and it can still resonate 25 years later. Does that answer your question? All right, does anybody have another question? Don't be shy. Um, kind of just in general, what do you do? And maybe like some sort of timeline of how you got there out of high school. What I do? Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, should I start at the beginning or at the end and go backwards? Beginning, maybe. All right. I think probably best described as punk rocker, but <laughs> it's a word that actually has so many definitions that it's it's very elusive. In my mind, it's clear that it, it means the free space. It's just a term, a term that's ever-changing that means the free space where new ideas can be presented, where profit is not dictating the sound. So if you think about it, like when you think about like new ideas, like if there's a place in a book, say you have a venue and you want to book a band, and you want there to be an audience, like you're going to book a band that has maybe either somebody in the band who's from another band, 
a band that's already well known, uh, a particular genre, um, uh, just something that people would come to because that's like, oh, I want to see this band, I want to see this kind of music, or I want to see something referential. But new ideas don't have an audience because they have not been thought of yet. And for me, punk rock was the place where just people who were interested in new ideas would gather. And then that gave, it was like the stage. Suddenly, like, people just come out and like, what do you got? And people are like, well, check it out. I'm going to play this on like, like a Clorox bottle. And you're like, wow, that's weird. Go for it. And it's very, that to me is punk rock. And especially kids, like really young kids who have never played instruments before, really, and they're grappling with their instrument, whether it's a guitar or drums or anything else, they're trying to figure out like who they are, what their instrument is, and how these two things, what this relationship, what it does. And in that grappling, even though in their mind they may think that they are maybe like you know, Ray Vaughan or whoever, they go or whatever rock person or music person, they may think that they're emulating somebody. In fact, what they're doing quite often is making something completely unique. And there's a period of time, I feel, where before they realize like really how to play their instrument, and after they're just completely aping somebody, but somewhere in the middle of there, there's this incredible flash of improvisation <coughs> that's never been done before that is so beautiful. And that is always intriguing to me. And that's why when people say, like, punk is dead or punk will never die, it's obvious. Punk can never die because it's, it's every generation is always going to have this moment, this like transition. And it doesn't have to be like 13 year olds, it could be 33 year olds or 53 year olds. It just means that when people are coming to terms with their instrument and really trying to challenge like the status quo or challenge the, sort of the conventional ideas of music. So that's what I do. Along with that, I have a record label called Discord Records which was started in 1980. I'm in a band called The Evens, the duo. Before that, I was in a band called Fugazi for 15 years. Before that, I was in a band called Embrace for about a year. That was a crashing plane. Um, <laughs> before that, I was in a band called Minor Threat for three years. Before that, I was in a band called The Denials for a year. And before that, I was in a band called The Slinky for one show. Then somebody had to go to college. Um, <laughs> I'm from Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., as you may or may not know, in the mid-1970s or late-1970s was not considered a hotbed for music or culture or anything else. Um, I am actually a native of Washington, which is unusual. In fact, I'm a fifth-generation native of Washington, D.C., which is even more unusual. And growing up there, I think I realized that as a, like, a kid, there was no, I was a part of no culture at all. Like, I didn't feel, like, nobody paid any attention to the kids like us. We just were, like, there waiting to go to college and get shipped off to whatever job we were going to be doing. And I <clears throat> clearly remember, like, getting to an argument in high school about this punk rock stuff. Now, I loved, at that time, I loved Ted Nugent. I was obsessed with Ted Nugent. I know, sounds crazy. <laughs> But it's true. The thing about Ted Nugent, though, this is something everyone has to remember. 1975 and 1976 was so radical. I mean, I saw him play and he spit on stage and cursed the audience, which was like unheard of in my life. I've never seen him quite like that. And, you know, I thought he was an animal rights kind of guy. For those of you who know who Ted Nugent is, he's a, that guy, he's such a shithead. I mean, he's a right <laughs> White, like, white, insane, murderous hunter who wants to like shoot anybody who disagrees with the camera, Dick Cheney, and it's just like you just start to feel like. But at that time, 1975, when I read the interview with him, he said, Ted Nugent said, "I only eat meat that I killed myself." I thought that that's radical because because I'm sure I knew meat was just like you know, like. This, you just got it like a little rash. Like, okay, we, we didn't know where it came from. <laughs> he, took, he was taking some responsibility, you know? Also, this is interesting. He was totally straight. That was a, that was definitely unusual in that era, like 70s rock guitar dudes. Um, so 
I can remember getting into like a really intense arguments with my friends in high school about who rocked harder, whether it was like <laughs> the Dukes or the Ramones, that kind of thing, you know? And at some point, they said, have you ever heard the Ramones? Have you ever heard the Sex Pistols? I was like, no, but why would I need to hear it? And they said, well, shut the up. <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually hear, and you hear them, then, then you can make a decision. And a friend of mine lent me the first Sex Pistols record, the first Damned record, uh, first Generation X record, um, probably the first Clash record. And I went home and put those records on. And at first, the sound was, it was almost frightening to me because it did not sound like music or music I had ever heard before. And I've used this analogy before, but I think it's really apt. If you grow up eating only like hamburgers and french fries, and that's dinner, and then you go to like a Japanese restaurant, they put food in front of you and you're like, what's that? You know, what is that? The thing is, it's food and it's probably better for you. And that's what I started to find out about punk rock. It took me a while to understand it. At first, I couldn't quite recognize it. I was like, it hurts my ears, it's weird, it's scary. And there was one particular song, and I don't know how many of you are really familiar with the first Sex Pistols album, the song Bodies, which is a song about abortion, which, I mean, I've never heard anybody sing about, about abortion before. That song actually really terrified me. And because I have a personality, if I see Something that's scary, I will run right to it. That's me. I'm curious. Um, and I think I, I, went, I got it. I was, just like, I was like, wow, this is incredible music. And it was such a liberation for me because I started to think, like, this is actually the world I, maybe I was looking for. The first show I saw was a band called The Cramps in February of 1979. Um, the show was cathartic beyond belief. And it was where I really realized that that was my tribe. Part of the message I got from punk rock, though the people who I was listening to may not have actually been um, intending this or practicing it themselves, the message I got was self-reliance, like self-definition, uh, taking responsibility and having independence. So the idea of like being on a major label, that was totally gone. I was not interested in that whatsoever. I never thought about that. I was all for, I mean, I wasn't interested in it at all. It was never like, if I could just do this, then that could get the attention of that person. I don't give a damn about getting anybody's attention other than people who want to make music with me. When I say that, I'm not talking about other musicians. I'm talking about the audience. Because that's who makes music. Like, when you play music, that's one thing. But it doesn't become a song until it goes into somebody else's ears. So that was the idea of punk rock, of people coming out and making these, having these evenings, these moments with people every night, like just going out to play, that was incredible and a total true narcotic in the sense of like just wanting that and not giving a damn about the business because the business seems to work against that so intensely. So I think over the years, because of growing up in Washington, having no idea about the music business whatsoever, we had to craft our own business. So when we started the label, 1980, we started pure and simple to document the Teen Idols because the band was breaking up. We had some money, we had a tape, and we thought, oh, we'll put out a record. So we made this record, and we said, we just call a friend up. So like, how do you do it? And he says, call these people, call these people up, send them some money. And so we sent them the money, and they sent back a box full of like vinyl records, <coughs> seven-inch records. We put eight songs on it. Songs are like 45 seconds each. And then to make the covers, we took apart a little picture, so these are seven inches, right? <coughs> Pulled it apart carefully. We laid it on 11 uh, by uh, uh, 17 piece of paper. We outlined the shape of the unfolded picture sleeve. We put our artwork inside the tracing. We took that to a print shop. We asked them for a thousand. They gave it to us. We got this shipment back. We carefully or not so carefully, in case you be cut with scissors, every one of them out, folded and glued every one of them. And this went on for 10,000 records. The first, like, uh, I think the first of the first 10 records, I think it was eight, seven or eight, seven inches, and all of them were done by hand. But it wasn't because we were barkers. It wasn't because we were, like, we just didn't know. That's all. And that's the thing, like, let's, let's 
let's make a show. That's what we were doing. That's what I do for a living. I don't really know how to do things. I just figure it out because anything can be done. And the one thing that's really vexing about the music a lot of times is that the business has this sort of, um, these kind of strictures that people like, well, you, oh, you have to do this. Like, for instance, like, and I'm not trying to get all heavy about MySpace or any of that kind of stuff, but I actually find MySpace, it's a little bit of a concern because so many people are huddling under one roof. You just start to, I worry about that kind of thing. I also worry that if you're not on that, then suddenly you just, you don't exist. I've had a situation where someone said, I called up a little coffee shop about the Evens playing there, and they said, they're like, oh, um, we don't know your band. I said, oh, well, I'll send you a record. And they're like, well, if you don't have a MySpace page, you're probably not very serious about this. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's kind of thing, like, I would always think, like, well, it's not, it's not, that's kind of, that thing always, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised in a few years from now if you all were to invite me back that MySpace would just be gone. But of course, they all, all this stuff is so fluid, it goes on by. So that's, I think, my point of view, the strictures of the business are often the things that trip people up and discourage them. Ultimately, a lot of the business is often the opposite of music. Did I answer your question at all? No. All right. Try, did anybody else have a question? Yes. I don't mean to uh, digress so much. But, um. Uh, I, I really like the Obsessed, and I was wondering uh, how you got into the Obsessed, and like what an Obsessed show is like, and like, what wine it was like. Wow. Uh, he's talking about a band called the Obsessed. The Obsessed went from Rockville, Maryland, which is a, <clears throat> about 15 miles outside of Washington. And there, I guess what's been come to be called uh, Stoner Doom? No. What's it called, that music? Good. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, some kind of music, I don't know. But they're, um, the Obsessed were a band that were, like in the world of DC hardcore, early punk rock in the early 80s, there was these guys that would show up who were like, wore, had really long hair and wore like leather jackets with like cat pelts on the back of their jackets and uh, eyeliner, and they were just really weird kind of scary, heavy metal kind of dudes, but they were really into the punk shows. And at first, there was a little bit of friction. I remember the show, The Obsessed Play with the Bad Brains, the first time I saw them uh, at the 930 Club. And these guys, we thought The Obsessed were like a gang. And so these kids, all these kids with their cat pelts, like, <laughs> were at this show and were like, trying to dance with us, but it turned into like, kind of like, a, we thought they were trying to fight with us, and this got into a mess. Um, <laughs> There was a party where those guys, one of the guys, they were basically, they're just, I think every region has a name for them. I know in the Northwest they call them Heshers. Um, it's probably, did it, anybody else have any suggestions for this? Like, what Hesh, you know, guys who like to, they just drink and get fucked up and play heavy rock music. What, any other names? <laughs> guys, you are shy or what? Huh? Well, that was bad. <laughs> well, Stoners, I don't know, these guys. But there's a guy named Wino, who was sort of the heart and soul of the Obsessed, um, who I first met in 1983. And he's kind of like a, he's a legend in a way in the Washington area. And I think that he's actually somebody that I think really would be incredible to have a very well written book about because the <coughs> stories are just so epic. We're talking about a guy that like got signed to Columbia or some label, moved to LA, was like doing really well, and then of course got into crystal meth and like basically sold all of his equipment and ended up walking the streets until his boot, this is incredible, this story. His <laughs> boots wore out, his feet like got, they became septic, right? He had gangrene, he ended up like in a rehab. And then uh, he told me, they gave him a pair of tennis shoes to leave. And he says, I don't wear tennis shoes. Um, I was like, what's wrong with tennis shoes? He goes like, they're not, they're not the, he says, people who are meaning, people who are serious don't wear tennis shoes. I was like, I wear tennis shoes. He's like, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> so he said he got the tennis shoes. I thought, I'm going to go, 
out and get some booze. This is the way I remember this story, of course. <laughs> Who knows? But he said he walked out of the rehab joint, and this is this is crazy. Think about it. Like he's been struck out, and he walks out, and there's a guy standing right by the exit door, and he says to him, the first thing the guy anyone says to him is, "Want to get high?" Can think about it. That's like a perfect place to like if you're. If you're selling drugs, it's a great place to stand, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so he was like, sounds good. But then, at that very moment, he ran into this friend of his totally randomly. And she was like, what are you doing? What's going on? Like, why are you wearing sneakers? But um, <laughs> and, uh, she took him to her ranch. Uh, this, is, this is all madness. But then he even took the, the Greyhound bus back to Washington. And he's like, now he's like a totally incredible 46 year old super healthy like I think he's a vegan father of uh, two kids still playing music still one of the greatest guitar players still an epic guy really interesting fellow and um, I mean I know some most people are like whatever but it's a good question thank you for asking me about it and actually one thing I should say for those of you who like Fugazi Joe Lally the bass player of Fugazi that he was part of the obsessed gang that was like, when I first met Joe, he had hair down to here and wore dresses and stuff. <laughs> he lived in a house with wino. And that was like, when Joe and I first started talking about music, we talked about The Obsessed. We talked about James Brown and The Obsessed and Delt Reggae. That was like, holy really <laughs> Did anybody have a question? Yes, sir. pick it up and go with it anyway. Uh, if everything's so grassroots, how did Fugazi get such a big name? Can you go through, you know, I mean, everybody's heard of Fugazi, everybody listed as their influence, but you seem to have like this whole grassroots underground, like how did it get so big? What was the, did you eventually hire somebody or no. was it just extreme work? No, I'll, I'll be straight up, there's, <coughs> we have no publicity people, we have no company that works for us, like, I booked a band. I did all the driving. Like we did all our own work. We don't have a manager. Our I own the record label. So it's actually, if anything, if you've heard of Fugazi, then it's actually kind of like evidence that would suggest that something that's just real could actually still get to the surface, which I find really kind of I find that really like someone told me call me up and said, Oh, they're playing a Fugazi song, like, at the Redskins game. I was like, what? Like, a football game? Like, over the stadium thing, like, whenever it's, like, second down on this side. They play waiting for <laughs> And then, just recently, we had a spate of communication from people telling us, oh, Major League Baseball is running, they're playing, wait, they play waiting room in a, in a World Series game, or, like, on the TV, you know, the, what they call the bumper? You better know this mm -hmm. stuff because that's the music you're going to be writing. You're not carrying bumpers. <laughs> Before and after you know, the game, then they go to a commercial, there's like the music playing, and they play waiting room. And they don't have our permission. We own all our own songs. Nobody else is selling our publishing. We don't have anybody exploiting our songs or promoting our songs. Like, so we are outside the cogs of that machine. And yet, our music continues to insinuate its way in, which makes me think that there is actually still possible for music that resonates with somebody to still be heard by many, which is nice. It's a nice thing to think about. Um, I have no idea. I'm not, I can't tell you why we got big or how we got big. What I can tell you is that we come out of like punk rock. We were like, we drove up Washington. We're all like really close friends. We're still very close. I talk to every, we all talk to each other regularly. Uh, we all live within the same area. We see each other constantly. We go way back. And when we started playing, we um, we were part of what was at that time a really pretty um, well-established network of <coughs> underground, like hardcore, punk rock, whatever you want to call it, of a scene. Like we, could, we, toured, I mean, we toured the entire US and Europe with no record. <laughs> just based on like just sending out cassettes and people just being like 
part of that scene and interested. Um, what we did do was we played a lot. We toured a lot. I, mean, I don't know how many shows we ended up going. Maybe 1,100 or 1,200. I have no idea. We played for, we were touring for 15 years. And we did a lot. We, you know, we just made a point also to go to places that nobody went to. So we played you know, in Tromso, Norway, which is 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle. They were psyched. And we were too, you know. That was weird. Um, we played like in, we played in a prison. We played in Tasmania. We played in, you know, we played at an Indian reservation. We just, you know, we were just interested in finding places because of the way we operated, because of our politics, the way we operated, the fact that we only play all these shows. We want to do low door prices, usually five bucks. Because of those things, it forced us into really unusual locations. And I think people were like, we want to go along for the ride. You know, that was something that um, I guess, I don't know why I connected with so many people. I mean, if you're asking me, like, how do you get people, like, how do you become popular? Write a good song. I don't know. That's all I can think of. You know, that's the only, like, but it's such a weird answer. But the truth is, straight up, there is no, there were no puppet masters. There wasn't anything weird like other, like we weren't on the OC, you know? <laughs> we weren't, uh, we didn't have some weird like behind the scenes like uh, street teams, you know, spray painting our names around town, you know, being paid, you know, none of that kind of crap was happening. We were just playing music and people were just making music with us and responding to it. That's what I got for you. Uh, are you coming down? I think so. Oh, okay. Uh, can we out? Uh, not you again, somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to me later. Yeah, I got it. Anybody? <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, all right, so what's the next we got the album? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In 2002, God, they went on an indefinite hiatus. What that means is exactly what it says. It's a hiatus, a break, which is indefinite, which means we don't know. In 1987, circumstances in our lives, the four of us, made it possible for the four of us to make music together. And for the next 15 years, those circumstances, though they became challenging, allowed us to continue. In 2002, circumstances in our lives, we're talking about our personal lives, right? We're talking about families, people were being born and people were dying. It became, there became a point where like, it's just not possible for us to continue working the way that we feel would be necessary for us to be like Pagazi proper. So instead of saying like, well, let's break up. I mean, we had two choices, break up or take a break. And since I think of breaking up is kind of seems absurd, since we love each other, and since it's just such a weird idea, like why, we didn't announce the formation. Like I didn't send out a press release like, hey, Pagazi formed, because nobody would have like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So why do we have to send out a press release saying the opposite? The other thing is that should circumstances in our lives ever line up in a way that the four of us want to make music together, I would like to do it without it being under the auspices of a reunion. I just find that discouraging. I'm not that interested in reunions, frankly. Like, music is a relationship. The band is a relationship. And the music that the four of us made is unique to that, to us. That's it. I could never make that music with anybody else. If Joe and Brandon McGee want to play music again, and they, and I said, yeah, let's do it. If we all do it, that's great. If not, that's great too. Life is fine. It's not that necessary. It's weird though. I have to say, the question about Fugazi, what about Fugazi? What's going on with Fugazi? Who cares? Don't worry. If we play shows, if we play buildings, we'll put up a flyer. Don't worry. We <laughs> <laughs> promise. <laughs> you get it. You were discussing uh, keeping the integrity of uh, low ticket prices when you guys were on tours or whatnot. Uh -huh. um, so say you're in a say you're in a town and say the local promoter that you guys have to deal with uh, wants to put a little bit more in their pockets. How do you guys deal with that? Yeah. Um, he's asking about um, <coughs> yes, sir. something actually we ran into a lot, which was promoters who were not interested in the low ticket price. Um, the way Fugazi was able to deal with that was not that we were exercising our muscle, like forcing people to keep the door prices low. Is that if they did it, we wouldn't play. For every game we did play, we said no to 100. 
And I think that's really, that's ultimately it. If you're a musician and you're in a band and you don't believe and you don't want to do something, then don't do it. That's your, that's your one vote. Don't do it. And find somebody else who will do it. Be comfortable with how you want to do things. I can tell you, in 19, I was actually just, a friend of mine asked me to look up something in my journals. And I kept a pretty good journal from 1983 to 1994. And in 1987, Fugazi went up to uh, play at a place called the Anthrax in Stanford, Connecticut. It was a kind of a mid to late 80s kind of punk, punk rock joint that everybody played. And I spoke with the person, who, and I booked the show. This is the other thing, I booked the show, so I know what the arrangements are. So I said, it has to be all ages, it has to be five bucks. Um, so we got up there, and I remember walking in, and I saw the chalkboard, and it said, you know, Gazi and the other band, and it said, eight bucks. So I said to the guy there, I was like, what's up with that? And he was like, oh, I don't know. I mean, the guy who runs the place will be here in a minute. You can talk to him about it. I was like, well, it's supposed to be five. Should I just erase it now? And he's like, oh, uh, we better wait. So the guy comes in. I go, hey, what's up with the eight bucks? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's what it's going to be tonight. I said, but did we not discuss this? Did we not actually discuss the door price I told you that we weren't going to play more than five? And he said, um, yeah, 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 but it's going to be eight. I said, oh, okay, cool. And at that point, like we were just getting up for, like we were getting set up for sound check. We had like the stuff out on the stage. So I just turned around and I said, you know, to the rest of the band, I was like, hey, put the stuff back in the cases. And put it back out in the van. And the guy's like, well, what are you doing? He said, oh, I said, well, we're playing a $5 show. This is an $8 show. <laughs> and he was like, you're not going to leave. I said, pack the van. And this is exactly, this is the truth. And, and we loaded out. He's like, whoa, hold on. All right, okay. Like, it's just like this is the kind of bullshit that promoters will do at times. They, 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 but the only real answer to that is just to, you know, just walk out, boycott. That's, that's what we got. Um, there were definitely times where certain surcharges were added. Like, Ticketmaster really opened up a seriously confusing uh, array of, of ways to rip off bands. Um, never mind the insanity of the charges they put up for the fans. But for instance, most venues will charge a Ticketmaster charge at the window when technically they're not, they're not supposed to, but it's a sort of a loud, it's like sort of a little cream for the venue. So if you buy it in advance, you pay a service charge. You buy it at a show, you shouldn't have to pay anything more than the base value. But Ticketmaster kind of says like, well, it's okay. You can, <laughs> you can do that. And we actually, I'll tell you a great story. Um, do we have time for a story? Where are we going? So we're going. We're going. Okay. This is a Fugazi story. Do you guys want to hear a story? You have one yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, it's a good story. <laughs> really a great story. All right, 1993. We were playing really big venues. And we played in Kansas City, Can hold on. Hold on. Kansas City. Which one is West? That's Kansas, right? Missouri, Kansas, right. Kansas City, Kansas. Um, and we played this place called Memorial Hall. Is everybody from Kansas City? Have you been to Memorial Hall? You know that room? Yeah. It's a big room, right? Yeah. We sold like, I don't know, 2,800 tickets or something. It was a big show. And we got there. They were charging a service charge, a dollar extra. And <coughs> I was not, I knew the scam. They were saying, well, it's a Ticketmaster charge. But I knew the Ticketmaster did not take money from the night of the show. So I knew the venue was, was like putting a little cream on for themselves. So we really, I argued with this guy so hardcore, but I was stuck with a local promoter who was dealing with the hall. And sometimes, like, I can only yell at the local promoter so much. Because he's, he at that time was just not in a position to actually change anything. So finally, I put a sign up on the window of the front of the hall and it said, um, people, there will be a dollar extra charge um, on your ticket. Fugazi apologizes for the inconvenience. However, Fugazi does not apologize for Ticketmaster or the people who run this hall. And I put that in the window. And of course, they found that to be, um, yeah, they had a problem with that. And, um, <laughs> but I was like adamant. If they're gonna, they, they had another uh, six or 700 tickets coming through, and I felt like, Cheap with them, and it made me feel bad. Like, I mean, you gotta think about it. Like, we had sold 
2,800 tickets. They should like, actually treat us with like a modicum of respect, not treat us like garbage. So the gig starts, and we realize this is a room that is bleachers, right? And for somehow, even though it's general admission, half the tickets is random. Half the tickets are like red, the other half are blue. And if you get a red ticket, you have to go to the bleachers. The blue, you have to go to the floor. It doesn't make any difference where you want to be. And there's, it's just like whatever ticket you get designates either in this bleachers or on the floor. And a lot of people are like, we want to be on the floor. And we're like, nope, you got to be. And so we got into a long protracted argument about that. Saying, well, why can't people just go where they want to go? And they said, it's a fire marshal issue. And it's what, uh, it was just such a headache. The whole night was such a headache. When we were playing, um, the bouncers were constantly fighting with people trying to come onto the, the floor. And it became, I started to be concerned for the audience because the bouncers were very aggressive. And this is something that I had to deal with a lot, being in a band, watching the security actually cause most of the problems, which is really the truth. Um, <laughs> quite often, that's, you would see that security people were really, they were the immovable force which conflict really was like springing up from. Um, so at some point, I became like really concerned about the situation, and I said, turn the hall lights on. So we turned all the lights on, and people were like, boo, turn the lights off, turn the lights off. They hated being seen. I like the lights on. Like even now, it's a little dark up there. I don't really like that. I'd like rather see everybody's faces. I just like that. I like to see people. And I definitely like playing in a show, especially when you have bouncers misbehaving. I want to be able to see that so we can not play not provide soundtrack for violence, whether it's kids beating each other up or, or security people beating people up. Like, I'm not interested in providing a soundtrack for that. So we turned all the lights on, and people were like, turn off the lights, turn off the lights. They did not like it. So I said, if you can get us, thanks, if you can get us 100 signatures, get a petition going, and give us 100 signatures, we'll turn the lights off. I didn't think this could possibly be done. We played like two songs, and at the third song, a piece of cardboard comes flying up the stage. <laughs> it has all these names. I don't know if they are real, but I still have the cardboard. And I was like, well, the people have spoken. Now, on this tour, Fugazi's light show was two halogen work lights on either side of the stage, right? <laughs> so we're, there are our lights with no stage lighting. So basically, this kind of light in the room and these two halogens. I said, you want really want to turn the lights off? And they said, yeah. I said, OK, let's turn all the lights off. So the room lights go off, and we turn off both the halogens, too. And this room is plunged in total like, <laughs> pitch black, right? And we played the song Blueprint. And the crowd just went insane. And all the kids were like rushing to the floor. <laughs> and they were trying to get out the floor. I mean, I think maybe I misbehaved a little bit. But at that point, it was just really it was such a surreal evening. That like we at one point, our, one of the guys who worked for us came out and said somebody's ripping off your dress. One of the bouncers is ripping off your dressing room. While we were playing, the bouncers got in our room. We went back and they had taken somebody's wallet and hid it underneath like the couch. And it, it was just really a bad, bad like vibe in the room. So the night ends. Nobody had been killed. <laughs> um, and I felt actually that we've done sort of a creative way. We've dealt with things. Way. It's been, it was a quite a, like interesting evening, and the, the PA person that, that was traveling with us, this guy Dave Brad, he was on the phone, and he'd been videotaping things. And at that moment, the guy who owned the hall came up, and he was smoking a cigar, and he said to Dave, Dave was on the phone, and he said, you know, get your shit out of here, get the fuck out of here. And Dave's like, I'm with the PA. He's on the phone, I'm with the PA. You know, we're loading out right now. My guys are loading it out. And the guy's like, get out of here. And he's got two bouncer guys with him. And my friend's holding a video camera, a little video camera. So he's going, this guy is insane. This guy has cigars. He's screaming at me. He goes, hold on. And he starts to film them. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy with the cigar grabs Dave by the back of the head and pulls his face into the cigar and tries to put the cigar into his eye. And then, like, this, he said, this like, burns him right below the eye. And then he says, get the camera and the film. The bouncers beat Dave into the ground and steal, take the camera from him. 
So we're at this point, we've loaded out. We're waiting for the PA to load out. We're out front. Dave comes running out and he's like, help, 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 they're pushing me and he's got the camera. <laughs> so of course, everyone goes running into the building to help. But they're met by the owner of the hall who has a pistol. And everyone turns around and is like, <laughs> everybody runs the hell out, you know? Um, because it's like, he's got a gun, run! Um, so we're like, this is, we thought, well, you gotta call the police. This has gone out of hand. So Guy from Fugazi goes up, bangs on the door, and he's like, we want that camera back. And he's keep banging, we want the camera back. And finally, uh, one of the voucher guys comes, just opens the door and takes Guy inside. It's just gone. <laughs> was that really a good idea? <laughs> he told us, he said, we went in, he was led into the office, the main office. The guy who owns the place was just livid. He's like, you know, building, then you can tell me how to like charge, all this kind of stuff. And he'd be like, look, all we want, all we want is the camera back. You know, it was our camera. And then finally, he goes, just give me the camera back. And so this guy gives him, a towel like folded over. And so he takes it and he opens the towel up and it's just shards of video camera. Like they smashed it into the tape. So he like, all right. But I mean, he knows he has a, the guy has a gun and he knows the other guy will beat him to the ground. So he's like, okay, well, thanks. So we go outside and we're like, we have to call the police. Clearly, this has gone too far. <coughs> so we call the police, but Apparently, I don't know this, the Kansas City police are incredibly corrupt, or at least the one who showed up, because he kept saying they was gonna arrest all of us. Like we're saying that guy pulled a gun on us, he beat up one of our guys, he destroyed property, like we, you know, we didn't beat up anybody. And he was like, he just basically said, There's nobody in the building. We're like, they're definitely in the building. You can see people like looking through the thing. <laughs> <laughs> he said, There's nobody in the building, you should you can just get get on out of here. So we're like, no, 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 no. Um, anyway, we were finally like driven out, and I thought, you know, I've never actually, like, when you're talking about like how do we get so big, I've actually never tried to manipulate the press or try to actually play the press at all. But I thought, this is something I feel strong enough about that I would like to, I would like to get this guy shut down. This is crazy that he would pull a gun on us. Um, so I called Polestar. Do you know what Polestar is? It's the sort of industry, concert industry magazine. I called Polestar up and said, hey, I want to talk about this venue, and I want to talk about our experience here, because I think that other agents should be very wary about working with this room. Um, and I actually kind of called other agents, too, and said, hey, this guy, we should blackball this guy, because he's insane. And Polestar, they took the story, and they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And it ended up being a little tiny bit, basically saying that, a melee occurred after we complained about the ticket price with no mention of anything else. And I called the guy and he says, basically, the owner of the venue said that he would sue them for libel if they wrote anything else about anything else that happened. It was a really interesting, it was like one of those experiences for me where I actually tried to go deal with the mainstream, their mainstream way and thought like, well, forget it, I'm just not gonna do it again. Uh, I'm, hey, I've never been back there, but why would I be? Because they would smoke my, the band and leave and then away. So, did I, did I do this? That would be a story. <laughs> um, good time to have a question. Want to do some more? Yeah. Okay. If it's six of the two, well, I'm happy to go as long as you want. So. Somebody? Red? Red? Oh. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. you might be <laughs> we have time for two? Okay. I want to talk some more. I wanted to ask you about um, getting records in the stores. All right. Especially nowadays with the record store being Best Buy's <laughs> and different cities. And them being all, them only same corporations that own a lot of the channels. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> it's difficult for me to talk about today because I've been doing it for so long. I mean, my initial way of getting records in the stores was actually just taking a box of records to the stores. <laughs> and my the Teen Idol 7 inch, we sold them for a dollar. We go to the store and be like, will you buy some records? And I say, we'll take five on consignment. I go, consignment? Just take, God, just take them, you know, like five bucks, help a kid out. So that was how we first started working with stores. And um, we became connected to this sort of large network of underground or independent record stores. Um, 
Fugazi, in 1991, 92, 93, at that, at that age, at that time, you know, Nirvana came along, and Nirvana actually kind of cracked open the chain store. They kind of like alerted the chain stores to the existence of this other music, so-called grunge or independent or whatever you want to call it. So suddenly, chain stores were interested in this kind of music, and they started to ask for it. Um, we actually never petitioned Best Buy or Tower. You know, they won the records great. They didn't. I don't care. I, I don't. I didn't, I'm not that worried, concerned about it. Um, Actually, they, they, they do a lot of things that are really screwed up. I mean, like any other giant retailer, they have their ways of really making it difficult for suppliers. Um, so primarily, our focus has always been on independent shops. Now, I know that today, like, you know, shops are closing, and of course, so are chains, right? Towers gone. I mean, someone, someone, someone just told me recently there's like, uh, there's only a handful of chain record stores that even exist anymore. Primarily because their bread and butter, which is really major label stuff, radio stuff, is primarily people are just getting off the computer, whether they're paying for it or for free. So I think there's like, well, that's, that market's leaving us. So they might be predicting this kind of leave, so they've already bailed out. That's the way they think. It's always like futures. Um, so in terms of today, all I can say is like, if you buy music from somewhere and you like that store and you make music, then take your music to that store and start just start learning the process. Create music that is in demand, and then people, the stores will actually will come to you. That's my been my experience um, to some degree. But I'm also I'm not a big guy to talk about this because I ultimately I'm not ambitious. I don't have like I don't think in terms of like I want to sell huge amounts of records. I really don't care. Like the best selling record I've been on, like say the I think the Fugazi. Um, 13 song CD. I think we sold over half a million copies now. But I don't think any more highly of that record than I do, say, um, the uh, Egg Hunt single, which sold maybe 15,000 copies. Or, I don't really care. Numbers don't mean anything to me at all. All that matters to me is terms of owning a record label. If 10,000 people want a record or a CD, I don't want to make 1,000 copies. And if 1,000 people want it, I don't want to make 10,000. That's it. That's the logic of my business. The same with booking shows. If a thousand people want to see me, I don't want to play if this holds a hundred. And if a hundred people want to play see me, I don't want to play if this holds a thousand. It's just practical. And especially in terms of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Did I do something? Okay. Um, especially in terms of making records, like... Essentially, a record that doesn't get listened to is a piece of trash. And I think the world is filled up with trash already. I don't want to add to that heap. So I just don't want to make, like, a lot of people are like, what's well, your you know, you make enormous amounts of records, ship them out, and you get a certain percentage of returns. That's it. I'm just not interested in any of that. I don't want any returns. I want every record I make to be actually listened to. Otherwise, I just have a piece of plastic. I don't need any more of that. Did I answer your question, Paul? Uh, you can wait here. Oh, can you come a little closer? Okay, yeah. I want to thank you for making this amazing music. Oh, thanks, thanks. And uh, second, um, I guess my question is, uh, you've done things your own way independently for, you know, since you started. And uh, my question is really general. Uh, do you have any words of advice or just, you know, whether it be practical or more general advice about... Well, I gave you some pretty good practical yeah, advice. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm sitting here in my phone. How am I going to order this question? Well, I'll but tell you, when people ask me this kind of question, I always... I always say, like, basically, if you want people to remark upon your music, make something remarkable. Like, don't worry about what other people want to hear. Think about what you want to play. And whatever you do, like, if you're making a record label, or you want to start a club, or whatever you want to do, like, love it. Because that way, if you don't reach whatever success it is for you, like, if you have some idea of a goal, at least you want to spend your time doing something you love. That's a, that's just solid advice. You know, that's the, that's what I, that's the way I try to live. I'm actually somebody. Oh, thanks. Um, if I actually don't like, I'm not. I did. I said earlier, I'm not ambitious. I'm not goal oriented. I actually don't think about the future. I didn't think about like 
when I was 19, 80, I wasn't like, where do I want to be with this in five years? I don't think about that. I always think about what's in front of me. Like right now, I'm just thinking about talking to people. That's it. I'm not thinking about like what I'm doing tomorrow or next week. I don't, that's, it's irrelevant. This is what I'm doing right now. And in terms of a band, like people say, well, for God, it was such a success, it's an incredible success. But I would say, God used success on our, the first time we practiced. The first song we wrote was an incredible success. The first practice was like, that was great. The first show was phenomenal. The fact that we managed to do a show, we put out a record and a tour, that's incredible. So success is not, it's not a goal for me. It's the do every day. That's the success. So that's, the like, God, I want to love what I'm doing. Because like, I know that, like, what is success? Well, I don't even know what it means. People say, well, don't, don't, because I mean, you sold so many records, but what does that have to do with anything? I mean, you think, you put that into food, you think about, like, what's the number one selling, like, food in the world, the, the most <coughs> restaurants in the world? What, what restaurant is it? It's obvious. It's McDonald's. But does that make it the best food? I don't think so. I mean, it's pretty clear that actually it's the opposite. So in terms of records, or TV shows or movies, a lot of times the things that sell the most are actually kind of the most like homogenous and the least interesting. So for me, success is actually in creating something that is real, that actually is a part of you. Which is what I try to do every day if I can. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right. How are we doing? You want to keep going? You want to stop? Keep going until you want to leave. Okay. Mm -hmm. He says keep going until you want to leave. So I'm happy to keep talking. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Um, hey. The first records I bought were uh, Nevermind the Bollocks and Minor Threat Photography like a decade ago. Wow. I've watched a lot of uh, like Minor Threat videos and they're really intense. I never really got into Fugazi, but I've seen a couple of Fugazi videos where you seem like you like, discourage a lot of dancing and things like that. Can you get into right. that? I don't discourage dancing. That is a fallacy. Um, Fugazi, yeah. Fugazi was a band um, that played. As I said, you know, over a thousand shows. And in those shows, and within those thousand shows, there were six or seven incidents that resulted in somebody losing the ability to walk or to move. But immediately they lost everything below their neck. These are not people who are jumping off the stage. These are people who are being jumped on too. So I feel like as a performer and a musician, and the music is the gathering point, since I feel like that if I'm gonna play music that people are gonna come see me, like I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna stand by and just let people get injured. I mean, right now, if someone came in and started like hitting you with a machete, I would hope you would go, stop it. You know, I say stop hitting the guy with a machete. You know, that's the thing. And but if you're in a band and you see people beating each other up or beating somebody up or jumping off like we had people jump off like PA stacks that were 15 feet high. Now someone's going to get hurt, right? It's obvious. So if you say stop it, then everyone's like, well, they're like, they think they're cops. They tell us what to do. But I'm a human being. Now if I was walking down the street and I saw you standing on top of a wall 20 feet high and you're going to jump, I'd say, don't do it. You're going to hurt yourself. It is obvious, right? So this idea that we were against dancing, it's actually bullshit. The fact that we are pro dancing. We are against weird behavior that everybody picked up on MTV. Like, you knew it was bullshit because you're playing the quietest song, and suddenly some guy is like, like jumping off the drum riser or something. <laughs> but it's just boredom. And the other thing is, especially in the 90s when crowd surfing became like de rigor, like everybody was doing it, what Crowd surfing, I mean, I, for those of you who've done it, you probably know this, for those of you who don't know, the way you get up on top of a crowd, usually, is your friends give you a little leg up and they throw you up. And usually, for whatever reason, you don't, like if there's a crowd, you don't throw them into their faces, like, it's like you always throw it from the back, you know, towards the stage. I don't know why. It would seem to me that if you're gonna throw a human body, which weighs like 150 pounds or more, you will at least give people a little warning about it. <laughs> so they always throw them up. And because of that era, because of this kind of ritualized behavior that was being so advanced by MTV, what happened, the economy of a rock concert really shifted. Because suddenly security just exploded. Like, you know, in the early days, early 2000 shows and my favorite shows, 
We never had security. Why would you pay a cop to come to a rock show? <laughs> like, what the hell's that about? But like, we had shows where we had like, 30 security people. We had shows where we had a barricade that was so giant, it was like a T-shaped barricade that split the crowd into half. It was like crowd management. And because of the shape of it, you had to bring in, you had to hire 20 or 30 security people to stand inside the barricade because people, of course, are going to come over the head and drop into the barricade. So these people are hired to catch all the news. Where so essentially, it's like the whole economy of rock and roll. Like basically, crowd surfers. It's your fault for the ninety-dollar tickets. That's right. Like you created an economy that was really insane. <laughs> um, Think about it, like if you, for those of you, like, if anyone have ever been in the front row of a show on a barricade like this, and people are crowd surfing and they come from behind and they catch you in the back of the head, and you're like, oh, like, oh. <laughs> like, like, think about, think about the human body. This is a neck, right? Here, this part. And if you have big, heavy, dumb, drunk people pulling your neck over, it's like eventually it's going to pull something. And it just, it's, a, it's absurd and it's obscene. And yet, so many people are like, well, we're not going to tell people what to do. Well, fine. Uh, that's fine. Don't, don't tell them what to do. If I'm just not going to play music, I'm not, as I said before, I don't provide music to a person to a soundtrack for violence. I'm just not going to do it. Um, this is, I had a really, there's a great story. Uh, a friend of mine was working a gig with Bob Dylan around this time. And here was a little production. And, Dylan did a show, and a guy crowd surfed for a Bob Dylan show. <laughs> and so my friend who was working there was really like appalled. Like, he was really embarrassed. Like, oh my god, that's so embarrassing. Um, and he, but he overheard Dylan's management. And they were like, wow, did you see that? A guy was crowd surfing. How exciting. Bobby would love that. Like, we get to real zing to the act, you know, I was like, this is, this shows you the, the insanity of the way people think about things. It has nothing, it has nothing to do with music, really. None of that did. I understand, like, I have jumped off stages in my life, but like, you know, I'm jumping off stages in a room with like, 10 other kids, and we're all basically jumping from the stage to the floor, and occasionally, like, somebody like, our friend's like, come on, we'll get you, you know. But it wasn't this sort of like, this is madness. We had, in the state of California, when Fugazi played the state of California, we were on a blacklist for the insurance companies. We couldn't get insurance because a guy in Los Angeles at the Palladium got past security, got on stage, crawled to the top of the PA stack. We stopped. I'm like, get down, don't jump, don't jump. Everyone's like, don't do it, don't do it. And he's high, right? And he's like, oh.
food tasters to make sure that, that yeah, it's kind of ugly. It's a definitely a question. <laughs> it's like going to see a movie, right? The light came down and immediately everybody starts fighting. Um, <laughs> so it's pretty obvious that you were part of something, whether you want to call it a movement or a team or a part of history, that affected an enormous amount of social change. Um, I know you, you definitely weren't probably thinking of a lot of it at the time. Um, you were just, just rolling with it probably. But looking back, were there any key elements of this movement or this scene do you think allowed it to be so successful? And by that I mean the whole time from epic to yourself, the straight edge thing, any, any of the impact you think your music has had in the world? Um, anything specifically that really helped it happen? I know that's a really insecure question. And what that, uh, I can only answer by saying that I don't think about stuff like this. I, I really don't think about like, like for instance, there have been a number of books written that talk specifically about my past. I don't read those books. Because I don't want to read somebody else's take on my personal history. There is an interesting aspect of having played music for this long and having sort of had a label for so long and sort of but just being myself and not kind of getting off that, like just doing things the way I do them, that I've created quite a legacy in a way that a lot of, in other words, I'm just spending a lot of time talking about what I've done, which really can interfere with what I'm doing. And I don't, I'm trying really hard to not allow that. And, and in some ways, even like these kind of events, like, like I like talking a lot. I enjoy, I like the fact that people are, want to ask questions. And I really believe in the idea of revealing the ladder because I think a lot of musicians get to this place and like, oh, God dropped me off here. You know? <laughs> but actually, it's just a ladder, it's just work. And so I'm happy to talk about things. So like, as much as I'm happy to tell a story that's funny or to yell about stage diving or whatever, and I also like talking about like, just this idea of like, yeah, you cut the sleeves out, you just figure out how to do it. You can become creative and you don't get daunted by what seems like an impenetrable structure. Because no structure is impenetrable. You know, that's clear, right? Water will get through anything. So the, the question, I guess, is like, why am I doing this? Because then ultimately, I am talking a lot about like the past. Well, that's all we can really talk about, ultimately. Um, and I hope that in the kind of in the talking, there's some kind of like people are like, yeah, this is actually real. Because that's what I try to come away with every time. Like, that's real. This is an interesting way to spend time. It's better than playing a video game or certainly better than going to a bar. For at least, at least you can see each other. Um, I guess I feel like that I don't think about what what's what led to this or whatever. I just don't think about it. I'm only thinking about what I'm doing now. So for me the evens, if that thing I'm not I'm not, I'm not trying to promote the evens, I'm just being straight up. That's what I work on. Like I spent the last two weeks really working hard on booking these shows up to Boston and back. And it's something that we've come to here's an example of what we've done. All right. The evens, we have our own PA, a small PA, and our own light show. Our light show is this. We took two microphone stands and we put light sockets on top of them and put 100 watt light bulbs in them and then shades. But now they can, we can put them on either side of the stage and we have our own lights. So suddenly, we're a completely self-contained package, right? We can play, we play shows on our own, usually, just one band. We play venues that don't usually have bands. So, but we did it on our own, we have our own, our own setup. We don't, like, we can set up on any corner you know, which is interesting. We thought, all right, let's do shows early. Because people, like these 11 o'clock shows, like, like when you see a movie, like in the afternoon, you have the whole day, and like you come out and you still, you can still think. You go see the midnight showing, at the end of it, you're just like, oh, just get me home. And my experience with music is that shows got progressively later, and then by the end of it, you're just like, yeah, I just wanna go home, I'm exhausted. <coughs> I actually the idea of music being people coming together, talking, music playing, and then people hanging out and talking some more. I like that idea. So we said, Amy and I said, like, well, let's move it. Let's do 8 o'clock shows. 7.30 doors, even to play at 8 o'clock. Play for an hour, and then another hour after that, we bring down and talk to people. What we found out, though, was that it was a lot of people who worked, couldn't get off work, get home and have dinner, and make it out by 7.30. So now we do. 8.30 shows. So this is the way we're thinking. This is the kind of like constant little adjustment, just thinking about the situation and trying to be creative. For instance, we came up with this idea of under 12 free. 
to the court to go away is going to hold and say all of the shows. But under 12 free, not because like kids need to, like, they can't afford the five bucks, but rather it's for their parents. Like if you have a kid in the age and they may or may not make it for the sh through the show, you might be like, ah, I don't know if I spend five more dollars, you know. So this is just, so we said, hey, under 12 free. It's just, it's just an idea. But it's, it's just constantly tinkering and playing with the idea that, and actually existing in real time. And that's the way I do it. So I don't really think about what I did in the past um, because it just, it's not relevant anymore. The landscape has changed. Does that answer your question? <laughs> How are we doing? Anyone yeah, join us at home? Yeah. What about your class? <coughs> You have a class here? Yeah, now. Oh, good, okay. This is your class now. Uh, I'm not even in that class. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I want to know, um, what, can you explain briefly like, the importance of local music to you, and um, also like what it is in D.C. that makes the attitudes that great bands like you and the other popular like D.C. bands, the Sweet Man, and lots of stuff that's just real passionate and all about um, being local, so. Um, I guess my sense about localism um, or regionalism is that I've always been really fascinated with regional accents and, and, uh, and actually communities and, and early music, of course, when I first started playing pop rock stuff, uh, there was no national channel. MTV didn't exist. It was just actually, you know, there were like regional hits. And because of that time, it was, it was like YouTube, all this like video evidence of everything. If you were a punk rocker at that time, you didn't really, you never really knew the other people. You saw photographs of other scenes. You heard their records. But everyone knew about punk rock, and then they tried to actually kind of create their own version of it. So each area had a really unique style. New Orleans had a really unique style. There was a band called The Sluts who were from here. That were really, like, that was, that was New Orleans. You know them? Were you in them or something? Uh, I remember them. Yeah. I mean, it was like, there was like, it was like, there was, each town had its scene. And so when Minor Threat would go on tour, we visit these towns, and it was so incredible to meet, like, people, their version of what punk rock was supposed to be. You didn't have any blueprint. All you had was, like, the suggestion. And you heard, like, people were going to England, or people were going to Los Angeles or New York, and then you just kind of made up your own thing, because they, those bands were not coming to your town. And this is true. This is interesting. And there's a point in like 1982 or so that I could tell where someone was from by the way the band sounded, by the way they dressed, and even how they danced. Because nobody knew, everybody had their style of dancing. So there was actually there was a, 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 a dance that was like, you're from Boston, you're from New York, you know, you are from the Midwest, there's no doubt about it. Like you could tell, <laughs> like by, because things were so regionalized, it was primarily because there wasn't this sort of like across the board thing. Like the internet, for all of its good, also has its, this weird like leveling aspect where everything just becomes, everyone just kind of looks the same. You know, like all the bands they play, they're like, oh, that's the way we sound. And I find it actually discouraging um, for bands who like, all sound like one thing. I'd much rather hear something regional. New Orleans, actually, we were talking about this on the way in. <coughs> There's music in this town that is so specific to this area, like the brass band scene, all that, which is really, I, I just love that. Because, one reason I love it is because it really connects with a music in Washington, D.C. called Go Go, which is also incredibly regional. So it's been for 30 years, bands have been playing in D.C. It's totally underground um, kind of music that never really broken wide, but still, there are so many bands, they play every week, um, they have like residencies at clubs, and they they have instead of like they release some records, but they really have this very like hardcore um, board tape thing. Like if a band plays, the next day that tape that show is available either on the street or a couple of like places called tape like they're called like um, uh, live uh, live tape shops, and they're just like they sell the next day. So there's an instant economy. Like you see a band like the Junkyard Band, or Raw Image, or Critical Mass Band, there's all these, like, these bands. They're, does anybody, does anybody know Go-Go? Have you ever heard it? I mean, it's really, it's completely like indigenous. 
And for some reason, like it doesn't really resonate with people outside of Washington, but it, it cannot be done away with. All right. I remember getting, I picked up this, um, I picked up a CD by uh, the Little Stooges Brass Band, which is, you all know that record? Anybody? That's yeah. a great record. That's an amazing record. But what grabbed my attention was that it looked exactly like a go-go record. I mean, the, the graphics, I was like, wow. I was like, this is crazy. And I realized it just that's a super indigenous, and there's certain music scenes around the country that still exist. And I find that to always be the most compelling kind of music. Um, in terms of why we are who we are, the way people in D.C. are, I have no idea. I don't know. All I can tell you is that there is no music business in Washington, D.C. So if you want to make it in the music business, you better move. But if you want to play music, yeah, stick around. There's a lot of people who love it there. That's it. Is that a good way to answer? You want to keep going? How you feel? Anybody else have any burning questions here? <laughs>
there's a lot of connection like that. But in terms of each band, their business is their business. I would like we don't tell them like what they can put on their covers. We don't tell them to put on their records. Um, like in terms of the music, like if it's if music, it sounds like if there's something that's really glaring, and we're like as a friend, I was like, are you sure you want to put this out? You know. But ultimately, it's up to the bands. And we definitely don't. I don't book the bands. I mean, I would never. It would be impossible. And also, it kind of gets. If you do, if you book your own band. This is something to think about. If you book your own band, you know exactly what you're comfortable doing and what you're not comfortable doing. <coughs> when you're talking to somebody, they like they say to you like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this, yeah. Well, the stage is actually like you know 17 feet high, and you're like, well, wait a minute. You're like, is that a good idea? Like that's kind of you know. And if you have something else booking you, like they don't care. I can tell you this because I play the stage 17 feet high in Buenos Aires. Uh, in Argentina, Pagazzi played on the stage 17 feet high, and the bar was the, <coughs> underneath the stage. And that sucked. That was a terrible, that's a terrible way to play a show. You play, and people are like going up to the bar beneath you. Um, so in terms of the band, we leave it to them, of course. I, you know, and some of them, it's interesting. I found that the bands look after their own booking. It's hard work, but usually they're kind of like it goes pretty well spiritually, but at some point they turn it over to a booking agent, and I think booking agents, they're, they're a tricky bunch, because they have, their concept is, sort of like, they're trying to get the show done, so they have everything like a one-touch file, they don't want to have to make more than one call or send one the email, so they have certain venues they work with, certain like arrangements, they have, it's like there's a lot of weird stuff, and you end up being kind of cycled through, and my experience, I have one experience with a booking agent, um, Again, 1993, when Pagazi was playing a lot, we played for six months that year, and I had a friend who was a booking agent, I asked her to assist me in booking the band. We were, I couldn't book the band. If I'm gone for two months, I can't book the third month. I need to be home on the phone. So the way we worked it out was I would call her and I'd say, this is where we want to go. These are the rooms I want to play. If you, these are cities I don't know. Can you find out places that might be possible? You know, we kind of go through it like that. But I told her, don't ever lie to me, and don't ever use this for leverage, because that's what book agents will do. If they have a very popular band, then they get their baby bands or their little bands a show, they'll promise, like, the big band. Like, you book this band, I'll give you this band. Um, and I called her both. And, you know, I said, like, it's just not worth it, because what happened was, we got to a town and people were really upset with us for not playing their venue. These kids, it was like an all ages place in Seattle, they were very angry at us. Now, I was like, what's the problem? She said, well, we booked this other band, and we were promised we would play in our venue. But we knew nothing about that. This is a behind, like, this is a behind the scenes deal that this woman had made, who was like, essentially supposed to be helping us, but actually put us to an awkward position. So at that point, I was like, yep, that's it, I'm back, and I'll make the calls from now on. Because I know what the band will do and won't do. And it's just something to think about. So I always encourage bands to at least try it. Because too busy, and you really are bad at it, then get somebody who you really trust to do it. But remember, a book agent, they look at a map and they're like, well, that far is just two inches. But if you're driving, and they give you that kind of routing, it's like, you know, Washington, Miami, New York, Chattanooga. You know, that people have those kind of drives. It's insane. So just something to think about if you're on the road. I'm going to do two more questions, because I think everyone's getting tired. So. Or none. You decide. Okay. Can I ask up here? Uh, sure. I'll repeat the question. Um, curious about how you feel, and I apologize if it's been asked this already, but how you feel about digital music, you know, being able to buy songs online for 99 cents, iPods, you know, MP3 players. Mm -hmm. Does it take away from the music? Does it take away from the hearts of a couple little guys or the first little guy? Hmm. This question is what do I think about digital music? Um, uh, being able to buy music online, uh, also I guess also not buying music but getting it online, uh, iPods, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't have an iPod, uh, so I don't listen to music like that. Although recently, while making this last record, I realized that so many people listen to music with iPods now that when you mix a record, it's kind of and you almost. I wonder should you mix it for a year, you know, because it's not the same sonic thing. I mean, like speakers are not little earbuds or whatever you call them, you know. So 
I did think about that. I just basically was speakers. I don't, I don't, I don't listen to anything from the headphones. Um, I, I don't really have a really strong opinion about it. I mean, essentially, I don't. For me, what's important is that the music is transmitting <coughs> one way or the other. So when CDs came along, I remember people were very upset about it, saying like, "This is like witchcraft," you know, and you know, <laughs> CDs are terrible. And but I was thinking like, well. Like, what's weird, really? Like, a piece of light that shoots through a piece of plastic and makes sound, or a piece of metal that drags another piece of plastic and makes sound. I mean, they're both kind of this weird form. I don't know. I, I, just, I just don't even understand how CDs work, but, and I barely understand how mine works. Um, and the digital stuff, God, God knows. But at the end of the day, if people want that, and that's the format they want, that's fine. Like, we didn't. Discord didn't make CDs until 1986 or 87, but it was because people were like, we want to buy it on CD, we want to buy it on CD. So we're like, all right, we'll make a CD then. I don't care, I mean, I'll, I mean, I don't know if you've all, there's, there's a generation of kids that bought music on cassette. Like, they had cassettes. Uh, uh, repeater, forgot the record repeater, we sold 125,000 cassettes on that record, which is insane. Like. But that's that time that things like record players have gone away, kids in the rooms had boom boxes, and they wanted to get, and they bought the records on cassette. They had cassettes. I think cassettes were probably the worst format, period. But that's what people bought, so we made them. And then at some point, people were like, we don't want cassettes anymore, so we stopped making them. Now, people, some people, apparently, want to buy it online, or want to get it online. So, fine. Like, it was, I hadn't really thought about it, but some of the bands said, we really want to be on uh, iTunes. So we're like, all right. So we sat down, we talked about it, and Discord, I mean, our, our ultimate plan is to make our own download thing and sell it for 50 cents, just to create a governor, you know, just a way to keep things always like reasonable. Um, so we gave it to iTunes, and we, made it, we gave music to whatever the Microsoft thing is going to be, because they seem to be having such a hard time with it. Zoo or Zoom? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Zoom? Um, what's the problem over there? Zoom, eMusic, which is the, the subscriber based thing, and then uh, downloadpunk.com, which is a sort of a, a small alternative version that's not attached to Apple or Microsoft or whoever eMusic is. Um, Basically, just trying to make it, a, a, if people want that, that's fine. I don't really, I mean, I feel like that there was a visual kind of, what I think about, which is what I've thought about in terms of that format, is A, like the packaging disappears. So there's a visual component to music, which has been erased, even though I know iTunes now are just starting to show you the pictures of the records. But there's something about, with the packaging, essentially, I feel like sets the cadence in a way for music. And when you get a record, you look at the cover and it sends you a signal, then you listen to the record, it kind of creates a filter in which you hear the music, which I think is, if the artists are making that music, I think it can be really profound. So a really visually striking record can use some kind of information, which then sets the kind of tone in which you listen to the music. The other thing is, which is I think very interesting about iTunes, or download, downloading songs, is that it is basically split, parsed, records into like, like a 10 song album is now just 10 songs. And the idea of an album, like an actual considered like arrangement of song, the sequence has been timed out and the actual kind of consistency has been sort of split up. That's, I don't know what the psychological impact that's gonna be. It's, I feel like for me, there are many records I, I grew up listening to where it was the whole record. Like it wasn't just the one song. There might be a hit, but it was like the whole record. So these are all things that have like changed, but do I, I'm not gonna bemoan it, it's just what it is. And I assume that people always will be creative, people will always figure out ways to make something out of what's given. And I don't know if I'll be that person, but I'm just gonna keep on making records the way I make them. I mean, the even just recorded our new record, I recorded on an eight track at Discord House. In 25 years of recording, I've never actually engineered anything in my life, but you know, I just did half inch tape, eight track, really fussy machine, 
And we just did all the recording ourselves with no compression. Did, decided to try it that way, and it was a really satisfying experience. If only because instead of too many goddamn options, there were just decisions that needed to be made, like on the spot. Does it sound good? <coughs> Is the right take? Are we happy with it? Decide now, because that's it. You can't go back in and like move a beat. Did that answer your question, Paul? All right, are we done? Do anything else? Anybody I, just had, I just had a question about the Evens. Are the Evens going to be playing the War Crimes anytime? Oh, I just booked this tour up to uh, Boston and back, and I will bet you, we definitely want to come down here, and I will bet you that we will come here in the spring. Um, that's, I hope so. We want to play a lot. Um, if anybody has any suggestions, by the way. Uh, I do, actually. Okay, we'll talk about it. Um, it was, it was again, like, it was like me thinking about the scenario where I was in my life, like where things were in terms of music, and I thought a lot about the black box aspect of rock clubs, and thought about the way that, like, you know, like, you go down the street, and you're like, oh, that's a sports bar, and you go in, like, well, people are acting like they're in sports bars, you know, or if you go to, like, a, like, this is like a, uh, I don't know, like a weird jam band joint or something, like, you know, like, there's certain kinds of venues where certain behaviors are almost expected. And I started to feel like the rock and roll was like an economy and a kind of behavior that was so structured by the venues themselves that I thought, we gotta get we gotta save music. We gotta pull music out of these Because not that they're so evil. I mean, it just is, there has to be music outside of it. It goes back to that first point. Like new ideas don't have audiences. And for a rock club, think about it. This is you know what a medicine show is? Like a med medicine shows were um, these sort of touring things in the, say, the 19th century. These, there's musicians and acrobats, and so they would go town to town, and they would perform, and people would gather. And then, between the acts, like the doctor guy, the fake doctor, would come out and sell various tinctures and, you know, you know snake oil, essentially. These are, and essentially, everything was alcohol-based. You know, that was, it was essentially booze. They were saying, like, yeah, this is good for like, you know, arthritis, or this is good for whatever. Whatever ails you, we have these different kinds of lotions, potions, tinctures. That was called a medicine show. The music created the audience. The salesman took, made that audience into a clientele. It's still what happens today. That's a rock club. The band bring the people in. Between the bands, the snake oil is for sale. The whole linkage between alcohol and rock and roll to me, and music, period, I think it's a fiction and one that's been really supported by the alcohol industry. I don't, I'm not, this is not a, I don't think alcohol is evil. I don't think that people who drink alcohol are evil. I don't think people who make alcohol are evil. What I think is any industry that can harness a cultural voice, something as sacred as music, and dictate who can see the bands, who can listen to that music because they're not old enough or whatever, but they can dictate those terms and the economy of it, something is wrong. So I thought, how can we escape this black box? How can we escape this weird economy? What compels bands to always end up in the same rooms? And it's funny, I will tell you, it was playing here at Tipitina's in, the, I think, 2001 or 2002, the guys who played here. And I was standing, this is what it really dawned on me. I was looking at the board, like you know, the black board with the names of the band who was coming and so forth. And it was such a crazy hodgepodge of names. It was like, you know, the, you know, some jazz, much house brothers, or somebody like that, they're playing. And then like Steppenwolf, and then uh, uh, somebody like, you know, uh, Black of Arkansas, and then uh, uh, I don't know, any, any number, like some country guy, and then Fugazi. I thought, this is so weird. Like, it's like, what a weird world we live in. And we're all, it's like, what is this place? What is this venue? Like, what, how did this happen? 
And I, I thought, why do we always end up in these same rooms? What brings all music these back to these rooms? What is it? Volume. That's what forces the issue. Because loud bands need to be in places that can contend with the volume. And venues have PA systems, and they have the tacit agreement with the neighbors, essentially. So why is volume such a big deal? Because people have grown to equate power and volume. They started to think of the same thing. But in my mind, the most powerful moment in my life, period, was almost total silence. So I know that's not true. I know that volume does not equal power. It can be powerful, but it's not equal power. So I thought, let's make music that is quiet, that we have control of the music. Not quiet like, oh, we can't hear it, but quiet that so it doesn't require the, like, the services of these commercial establishments. Let's make music that can be played anywhere. And let's make the music the point. Let's make music the, the reason for the gathering. Let's remove the snake oil. Let's remove like the black room. Let's remove like the smoking and the social thing. Let's create a music at a point of gathering. Because don't forget, music is a form of communication that created language. It is no joke. I understand that the industry have tried to take it, call it their own. They always have these awards, best record, best music, best album. But tell me one of those songs, one album that wasn't on a major label. And then tell me the odds that every great song, every awardable song was on a major label. So we know music is something that is free. It's out there in the world. So the idea of the even, the idea of turning it down was like, let's reclaim music and give it back just to the people. All right, that's it. Thanks. Woo!